if you're looking for a place to hang out, figure out where you can take the next step in your dairy farming business, then you're in the right spot. Welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast. Here we will inform you what you can do today to future-proof your business for tomorrow. A big thanks to our sponsors from Terra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. I'm your host, Andrew Savage. Enjoy this episode of the High Performance Herd podcast wherever you may be listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and jump on our Facebook group, The High Performance Herd Project. Today in the High Performance Herd studio, I have Brent Boyce from Farmwise in New Zealand. Brent is a Farmwise consultant with many years experience in different dairy business. He is predominantly based at the top of the South Island in New Zealand and has become somewhat of an authority on variable milking. He's been generous enough to come in today and share with us the pros and cons of different variable milking systems. Hey Brent, welcome to the High Performance Herd podcast and tell us something about yourself that many people do not know. Well, here we go. Uh, Yep, 30 years ago I was actually a competitive bodybuilder and placed in the top 10 in New Zealand. Well, there you go. That is a that's a really good one. Uh, not not so much now. Or? Oh, my body's body's still a temple, but there's been uh, regular desecration since then. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I guess doing probably 60, 70, 80 thousand k's a year in a car hasn't helped your uh, no. bodybuilding prowess. No. no, I built it in other ways due to Afghans and uh, ginger nut biscuits. I think. <laughs> <laughs> There's gold. Yeah, it's an occupational hazard. Yeah, um, you've sort of become the the go to consultant in relation to variable milking and certainly got a name for yourself there can you give us a bit of an idea what variable milking is and how did you start spending some time in this niche right so what actually happened was in november 2001 we had a extremely wet uh, spring and one of my guys in murchison just in the top of the south here he had um, severe issues with laminitis and he was milking the traditional 16 hours and we look at twice a day, um, which is 14 milkings a week, and once a day, which is seven milkings a week. Well, he was milking 16 hours, which is um, it's about, uh, yeah, 10 and a half milkings a week. And he was milking at five in the morning and nine o'clock at night, and one o'clock the next day, and the hours were horrendous. And so he was getting out at um, sort of midnight the next um, morning, uh, half past one in the morning, and it was extremely difficult for him. Um, for his time wise so what we did then um, I sat down there and we worked with it and I said look why don't we make it seven o'clock at night and 11 o'clock the next day so we could actually function a little bit better and that became 14 16 18 and that was an hourly split over 48 hours so we did that for two or three seasons um, and then we realized we were changing our milking regime so um, the times of that what was originally 16 hours milking it was no longer a 48 hour split of 14 16 18 so we'd realize that those changes would then need to be changed even further. So I then renamed it three and two. So three milkings in two days. And it became quite varied since then. Um, in 2007, I was asked to speak at the inaugural Once a Day conference I had in Hamilton. Um, it was a Once a Day conference. I think they got me in for interest point only. And um, I spoke on three milkings in two days. And that was a that's what I called it. And um and that was sort of the thing that we did for many, many years. So we just wanted somewhere in between once a day and twice a day that was perhaps a bit more user-friendly. And people would change their hours uh, better to suit. But no matter how we did it, it was still 10 and a half milkings a week. And you milk Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. And then the next week, it was Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday again. And the weekends became quite a dog's breakfast. Um, in 2000. Um, 16 i got into um i was awarded a um, farm management uh, consultant of the year thing in uh in hamilton and um they turned around and as part of the package they asked me to write a paper on variable milking um as it was at that stage and it was mainly three and two and i took that and published that paper and it created quite a bit of interest and having that new profile with the the award it really pushed things along a bit and then about um, in 2018, 2019, Steve Davis, one of the scientists at LIC with, or I am with FarmWise, they turned around and uh, we had a chat with Steve and he said, well, he believed that we could actually stimulate twice a day milking levels, very close to it, if we only milked the cows twice in the afternoon. 
instead of seven times a week. And sort of that got me thinking. And I, I sat down there and I looked at um, the gambit of the whole week from seven milkings on once a day to 14. And in between was three and two, which was 10 enough milking. So it was all these gaps in between. So I tried to fill those gaps in between and hence there became 10 and seven, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it started then. So then I wrote a couple of papers on it and I said, what am I going to call this? I was sitting there, it was it, it, honestly, um, Andrew, it was an amazing eureka moment. All of a sudden we'd gone from this one, two, three things with seven, 10 and a half and 14 milkings. I thought to myself, there's all these gaps in between. Could we do 13 milkings a week or 10 or 11? So um, I sat down and said, so what are we going to call this thing? Because it's going to um, need a name. And I thought, well, I've done three and two. So why don't we just call it the number of milkings a week? And so I called it 10 and seven. And 10 and seven has become the, the mainstay for many people. Um, and that's milking twice a day, just Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And the rest of the time, it's once a day. And I think the thing that's really resonated for so many people around the world, and it is a worldwide thing, now is that um, the weekends are stable and probably for a mental health awareness thing if I've done one thing in the dairy and said that I think is very important we've actually given people their life back in many situations for me that's been a, a tremendous part of what I've uh, been able to achieve with this and so many people have adapted it and just run with it and I've spent a, a heck of a lot of time nurturing so many people to try and um, make it work on their farms so 10 and 7 is just one of the things we do uh, and there's other versions we can do of it. That's a great story. You must be pretty proud of how that's come about and, and how far it's actually spread. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I could say I'm sort of proud of it, but it's, um, it's a feeling of relief, you know, because I've milked cows for a long time too. And uh, you, you know how hard it is for people. And it's important that we're able to actually help people and spread it. And it's never about sort of keeping these tools to yourself. It's about how do we actually make it so that other people can actually get benefit from it. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Actually, on that farm management um, competition, I have a sneaky feeling my brother was the runner-up. <laughs> we maybe we won't talk about that too much, but I guess he didn't have to write a paper at the end of it. No, he did a runner, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can rub that in to him another time. And uh, I guess you talked about mental health, and I think employment. I guess here in Tasmania, in Australia, employment is the number one sustainability issue facing farmers currently probably outside of the environmental stuff. Uh, I know it's probably a little bit different in New Zealand, but do, how, how have you seen that variable milking helping farmers with uh, employment issues? Well, it's, it's, it's the attraction of staff and the retention of staff. Because when it came down to the fact of actually putting 10 and 7 together, um, a couple of the drivers for, for us here in New Zealand is often our, our rugby, uh, our football, or hockey, netball, net. they usually Tuesdays and Thursday nights. So if they're once a day days on the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, well, hey, you can go to practice. And often yeah. you, you can do that. And on, uh, you know, if you're once a day on Saturday and Sunday, well, if you've got young people and they're milking twice a day on a Friday night and they finish at half past five, finish milking, and they don't have to get to the shed till sort of nine, ten o'clock on Saturday morning or again on Sunday morning, there's room for a social life. And I found that was actually quite a challenge when you're, when you're a young person also trying to have a life um, if anyone's everyone's on 10 and 7 that works remarkably well particularly if you have several farms in the area um, yeah I, I think it's a huge um, part and parcel of being able to attract people and like you guys we have some serious issues attracting staff yeah yeah I think you did right and the, the workforce has changed a lot in the years and I remember as an 18 year old up in Taranaki having one weekend off a month you know cups on it 4.30 yep. and th there was no life outside of farming no. and I have, I've, I've heard uh, an analogy that the the problem with millennials is that they pointed out all the problems and I feel like you know we've had to have these shifts for us to actually be sustainable yep. would you agree with that yeah yeah and I think yeah. I've been pointed out as one of those problems yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, have you had much to do with just once a day milking on its own as yep. well so yeah. I would have probably 15 percent of my guys on once a day milking Right, yeah, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of all types of milking. It's um, everyone's got their own thing, and so I've got people on nine and seven, in Golden Bay, uh, ten and seven, three and two, eleven and seven, and twice a day, once a day, and people will change that throughout the season as well. So probably one of the things that I find quite surprising is the amount of people who stick with one frequency all year. And one of the things I've found with variable milking and um, is that um, 
I have guys who will do the first sort of three weeks on once a day and let the cows recover after carving. Then they'll perhaps go twice a day till um, Christmas or the end of AI, which for us is a more for seasonal milking. And then they'll go, say, 10 and 7 till middle of April and then once a day. And so they're doing, I think it's around, instead of uh, that, we're limited with our lactation. It's we're 1st of August to 31st of May because that's a, the pickup of the factory. That's our window. So there's 608 possible milkings on twice a day. And we can do the same or better production on 470 milkings. Wow. So yeah. it saves, if you're doing a three-hour milking, by the time you get the cows in, um, it saves 15 days of your life every year. Um, and that's a huge impact for the cows with sore feet. Um, the use you shared, you know, you're taking out all those milkings. You're taking out about 130, 540 milkings. And by doing that, your, your uh, machinery lasts longer. Everything lasts longer, including yourself. Um, and it's very important we look after ourselves. And the thing when we do that and we change our milking frequency through the year, um, we can do the same as twice a day. And it's, we've done that so many times. So production can stay the same as twice a day all year. Yeah, wow, well, that's quite significant. Yeah. Okay, and again, that's one thing that really concerns a lot of, uh, I find maybe a lot of farmers looking to exit may looking look at once a day as an alternative to maybe robots or you know they yes. feel like their infrastructure is yep. a bit rubbish and uh, they don't want to spend a heap of money, but maybe they've got five years left in them. So uh, there, there's always the question though, about that hit you take when you go to once a day milking and, and how long it takes your herd then to recover I have heard some numbers about that. Can you elaborate on, you know, if someone's trying to make a decision about once a day milking, what that may look like? It all comes down to the genetics and the cow's genetics as well. The people are the, usually the biggest problem. So it's the genetics of the people. Are they actually able to change? Um, and are they prepared to accept that change? The cows, I've got guys with big Holstings on once a day. They don't have to be jerseys. Um, jerseys and crossbreds are usually better, whatever better means. Um, but typically, you're going to find a 10% reduction if you convert to once a day. Um, you, you can maybe put the cow numbers up slightly to help. Um, it can take, I've had some guys who've been able to get back to their twice a day production in three seasons. Sometimes it takes five. And some guys never get there. And that's a fact. Some guys just, they just don't have the genetics up here. Um, the cows are pretty good. Um, and they just are unable to adapt their system. So you can coach them more towards it. It's interesting. I've got a, a couple of guys who have gone once a day, and we've actually put in um, a Monday afternoon and a Thursday afternoon milking at 3 o'clock, and their production's jumped up um, about within 2 or 3% of where they were on twice a day. So the once a day all week, except on a Monday and a Thursday. They right. chuck in those two milkings. And those two milkings are what Steve Davis at LIC called the recovery milking. So they recover the other, other tissue. And so the other tissue has got a, about a seven-day memory um, as to how she's treated. And so with that, um, two milkings a week um, on twice a day, um, and you'll know the farm in Golden Bay. Um, um, it's not too far from where your family farm was um, or is. Um, but the uh, with that, it's... Um, yeah, they milk at five in the morning, five five a.m. every day because the staff like it. They like to finish up. Any jobs get done, they can be done by lunchtime if they're busy. But on Monday and Thursdays, there's a it's actually a two thirty p.m. milking on that farm, right? And that's uh, eight hundred cows. Yeah, and that, they'll carry that on right through to through basically towards the middle of April, and then they'll go to once a day again. But they're trying to capture the the reason I said before about uh, twice a day from um, say first of September to say to mid-December, you capture that peak milk flow and then 10 and 7, then, uh, et cetera. But I've got guys who go 10 and 7 all season as well. It's a heck of a mix. And those guys who go 10 and 7, their loss is typically about 5% of what we'd see compared to twice a day versus 10% for once a day. So it's a good, happy medium. And it's interesting you talked about that once a day milking because um, some of the earlier guests I've had on uh, vets and they're really analysing collar data quite closely yes. and there's yes. a fair bit coming out around about transition time from calving through to um, twice a day milking and, and how that once a day period in there is actually having a significant impact on in-calf rates and cycling cows. Are you seeing uh, similar things at your end? Have you had a little bit dabble in the collar stuff as well? Yeah, we've, so, we've seen the um, the stuff of uh, the Waimati vets had 60,000 collars 
uh, the data available from 60,000 collars, and that was pretty significant. We saw that. Um, I've been doing once a day for the first three weeks now for nearly 20 years. And those guys who do it do really, really well. And it's the sustainability of actually saying, why are we thrashing our cows so much? You know, if I'm, I expected my wife to work um, flat out, you know, three hours after birth, I wouldn't be here. I'd be a yeah. dead man. Yeah. Um, and so we're doing the same to our cows and we're looking at the rumination effect and how quickly they resume their rumination after that once a day. And we see it. So I've had a couple of farms this year have actually done it. Um, every cow's had um, three weeks. So one guy used ProTrack and we had automatic draft. And the other guy just painted his cows a different color every week. So every Monday morning, they draft out all the cows that had three weeks on once a day. And they went back to um, twice a day. And he's never been able to get out of the 70, I think 72 or 73% was the highest six week in calf rate. And now he's at um, 86%. He's never ever been in the 80s before. Oh. And so he got a heck of a surprise. You know, it was, uh, and it was a pretty tough year too. So it wasn't an easy year. And he's lifted his uh, cows uh, a quantum level. Uh, he's taken a huge step in his reproductive uh, performance. So, yes, there is a lot of evidence to show that. And I'm waiting for some trial data to come through from one of the research stations, but we're seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence that when you're looking at 60,000 collars uh, and the data from the Waimati vets, it's pretty strong anecdotal data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, getting, it's getting pretty exciting in that space, isn't it? Well, the, the key thing is, you know, you mightn't have collars yourself, but if your neighbor's got collars, it'd be interesting to find out what information is happening around them and bless them for buying the collars, but we can learn from them for free. They say the grass is always greener on the other side. You may yep. as well go and have a little look. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, no, that's, there's no, no it's, like, it's like borrowing as uh, your neighbor's boat or something, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I, I'm pretty keen to touch on 16 hours of milking and a question I quite often ask or I hear discussions around farmers having, hey, when do you go 16 hours? You know, they're saying, oh, it's, it's a certain threshold at 1.4 solids or 1.7 solids or, you know, this type of um, thing that they're talking about. Would you have any suggestions around the best time yep. to adopt 16 hour milkings? Yep. So um, a good point is 80% of peak. So if your cows are peak at two solids, and they do a 1.6, that's 80%. Uh, that's, that might be 75%, actually. I need the calculator. Um, that's right. No, they can use their own calculator. You'll be right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, if a guy's doing two um, and the cow's at 1.6, there's no problem there. Um, but every herd is different. It depends on the feed supply as well. Probably the best way is to actually get out and have a look. In the morning, if your cows are still squirting lots of milk in the morning, it's probably a little bit early, okay, because yeah. the other capacity is still a bit stretched. Um, if you get down, so it, it's sort of buttoned off a bit and there's not so much milk leaking on the yard, then that's a good time. But I've got guys who will change over there, peaking at 2.2, 2.3, and the cows are doing 1.8. They'll go regardless. So the time yeah. is, um, you've got to be actually be selfish. It's all about you and your cows and yourself. And everyone's different. If there's a threshold, the threshold is, okay, 20th of December, I want to do it. So do it. Yeah. If your cows peaked at 2.3 and they're doing 1.8, well, hey, what's that about? Um, that's about 15%, 20% down. I'm quite happy with that. Um, yeah, 80% would be, uh, I wouldn't go any, wait any longer if you're going to go. But typically for me, you know, after five months lactation or at the end of AI, that's a great time to go. And the cows will settle in. Probably the biggest thing we see is people waiting too long and all of a sudden they've got a, a problem they deal with, they have to deal with. And in the old days, you were twice a day because you were saddest. Uh, once a day, you're a lazy hippie. And if you're on six, <laughs> 16 hours, you're confused or had a problem. And, you know, you're yeah. having to deal with this problem. So, um, and, and so we don't have to do wait for 16 hours. You can actually do it earlier. But the big key is if those cows are leaking like everything, just like they were on twice at the peak, then it's probably a little bit early. You take a bit of a hit. Probably be about 5%. Um, but I'd be, as long as they're not leaking that hard, I'd go, but definitely 80% uh, plenty of time. Yeah. It, any any later than that, only do it if you've got a problem then after that, you know, otherwise into it. Yeah, no, that sounds cool. And like I so said, there's a fair bit to do with get what's going on upstairs uh, around that as well. And, we've got to, uh, we've got to yeah. think about, you know, because the cow, the funny thing is, you know, we talk about flexible milking. Well, the cows are way more flexible than us. Yeah. And, and we, we think, you know, as I say, I've got guys who've got massive Holsteins. And these cows weigh 600 kilos and they put them on once a day. And people said it's not possible, so we did it. Yeah. And that's... um. 15 years ago now and they're yeah. still going and they love it, it right? 
The uh, LSC have a uh, once a day index, don't they? And uh, my understanding of my time with them was it's it's actually some of those high input cows that perform best in the once a day system because they have really strong outer ligaments and they're built to carry a heap of milk. Would that be accurate? You can do, but some of those others come in, you man, you just feel like you've got to put a wheelbarrow underneath it to get it into the yard. Yeah. Um, um, if they're like a really capacious cow doing 70 litres, I'd hate to see it, to be fair. I, don't, I think you struggle to put the cups on it unless you're yeah. seven feet tall. Um, but the good crossbreed cows are great. And any cow with good um, um, good udder, you know, attachment, et cetera, is usually pretty good. Like when, if you're going to start growing once a day and you say I'm going to be once a day all season, you really have to have probably 10% more cows than you think because there's going to be some failures. When I've actually converted guys to once a day, there'll be another couple this year I'll do, I've probably got about 15% of my guys are actually full-time once a day. Um, I would think that the best way I've ever done it is Christmas time, we go once a day. Oh, I can't go once a day, I'll lose too much milk. Well, you're going to be once a day all next year. I think we need to learn. And the best yeah. thing is that you usually got two more herd tests to do. You get a feeling of how it's going to work. Because if you go once a day first up cold turkey in the new season, often it's you struggle. The hard thing is for a lot of guys, they get there, they'll get to about sort of mid to late September and the milk production all of a sudden goes like that. What happened? And it actually freaks them out quite a bit because the cows all of a sudden, and they can drop and they start again at a lower level and that can be quite hard to do. So the best thing is if you're going to go once a day, start it, you know, the, the previous season, and that would be my best advice. Just to, so get yourself into the habit, get yourself into the thinking, understand the productivity levels, find out in your herd who's not going to make it. Because there's going to be a lot of cows in there, probably 10% of the herd are not suitable. So you're better off actually getting them, uh, you know, a lot of that work done um, when you've already got some runs on the board the previous year. Yeah, and it helps get the old lid in the right place as well as far yep. as the mindset around. Yep, yeah. the logistics, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, how, how many, like, there's a bit of build up to once a day then if you need a few extra replacements and that type of thing. How you know many years ahead do you think? Like, it's, it's obviously not a knee jerk thing. You still really need to kind of plan this to get good results. Yeah, yep. yep. and be careful of bringing, yeah, so two years is probably a good planning stage. So start thinking about how many replacements you need. Um, the thing we find, well, that I've noticed on um, in many herds is that when you go once a day, um, the heifers will only do about 60 to 65% of the main herd. Well, those heifers, if they're on twice a day, will typically do 75%. Uh, the three-year-olds will do 85 to 90%. And then, you know, the others are quite clustered, the mixed-age cows. But it seems as though those heifers in their first year will only do 60 to 65%. So be very careful about loading your herd with a significant number of heifers. And I typically find in my once-a-day herds, if we can keep the heifer numbers around 15%, that's a sensible way of attacking it. And so I've got guys who'll actually um, go out and get carryover cows, believe it or not, yeah. uh, for the attempt to go to once a day. Um, just so I know, A, they'll be, they'll be in good order, of course, but they'll be big cows. And you know they, they might have 15% heifers and 10% carryovers, just so they've got enough mixed age animals in that herd to carry the milk production. Because often the thinking is, oh, I'll just get some extra heifers. And that can actually seriously impact the production in year one. Yeah, right. That's really good advice. That extra hit that heifers take. We actually got a client yep. here in Tassie having the same conversation, and he's a little bit perplexed because his heifers are not performing um, yep. even. You know, so but he's comparing that to twice a day milking, so it's quite different. Yes, and so you know they'll only do sixty percent of that, and I've seen heifers sitting at fifty percent, and it's quite staggering. You think, what's going on? Why is it? And then you hear test the heifers, and you go, oh wow, they're just only doing 0.5 a kilo. Why is that? Yeah, yep. it can be quite quite um quite a surprise actually. Yeah, demoral. I, I have heard of a farmer also, I think it was maybe in the Waikato, but he actually transitioned cows by year group. So he spent about four seasons and he would transition. So he's running a twice a day and a once a day mob. Um, I, I think he was running two herds anyway, so it probably didn't make a lot of difference. And he just slowly increased the size of his once a day herd by year group over three seasons. Wow. Uh, and he transitioned that way and he suffered very little. He didn't, you know, they say the bigger the party, the bigger the hangover. He didn't take that initial hit in right. production. So I thought, okay. um, yeah, but good to dig his name that's out. Another, that's another way of doing it. And, mm. and, we, and we look at our milking frequency um, and, and think, you know, we get quite hung up on the times. But there was a there was an article in the Dairy Export here in New Zealand, oh, it'll be several years ago now. And there was a woman in the in the Manor too, and she was a, um, a, a, a sadly a solo mother at that stage due to an accident and um, 
Uh, she had milked the cows at 5 a.m. in the morning and 11 a.m. in the morning. Right. Yeah. So it was an 18 6 split. So she'd get up at half past four, get the cows milked in, um, be home for the kids, go to school, uh, milk them again at 11 o'clock in the morning. Wow. She was all yeah. done and dusted by three o'clock, ready for the afternoon. Yeah. Still peaking at two milk solids, just like the neighbors. Wow, that's, fast. that's interesting. It was yeah. quite stunning. So, you know, uh, uh, requirement to have all these hours at strict levels, like the old 16 hours, that's why we never do that anymore because it was just too, we don't need to. And when your people say, oh, it's better for them, well, most guys are milking at sort of 5 a.m. and 3 p.m. Well, that's what's sad about a 10 14 split. So, proportion wise, it's not that huge. Yeah, yeah. But it has a huge impact for, you know, like say, staff, the for people. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's about, you know, so really, this what keeps being driven home here is it's a people piece as much as a cow piece. It is. It yeah. is. And I, and I have guys who milk at um, on 10 and 7, for example, I'll milk at 5 in the morning every day. And they'll chuck in 3 p.m. milking or 5 p.m. milking um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Now, if other guys who milk at 5 a.m. on those twice a day days, 5 a.m. and 3 p.m. or 5 p.m., often it's 5 and 5, and they'll milk at 10 o'clock on the other days um, just because they want the staff to have a sleep in. And the differences we see are just minist- just tiny. There's no huge thing. And as Steve Davis from LIC has reiterated, he said it's not um, necessarily the timing it's the frequency and how often we rescue the utter tissue memory. And that, that to me was a real driver, how often we rescue that utter tissue memory. And, you know, you've got, you've a bit of experience doing this, Andrew, over the years and um, milking cows, probably the biggest weight I've seen is um, 15 days of the cow not being milked was she was sick with Ilaria. And on the 15th day, she rose again from the dead and she was standing at the gate and she wanted to be milked. And she right. hadn't had a set of cups on her for 15 days. I mean, we heard tested her. She was doing 1.6 and her herd mates were doing 1.65. And it was wow. really weird. Yeah. That's the worst case. This is an extreme scenario. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're very resilient creatures. And there'd be yeah. a fair few farmers, even here in Tasmania, they will ship cows across the Bass Strait. It's a it's about a 12-hour ferry ride on its own. So there's trucking and they throw lactating cows on straw for a few days, put them on the truck, get them here, milk them and most of them fire back up and it's like they've never never even been anywhere, you know. Right. And, this uh, is not this is not an extended ten and seven you're doing. So one one morning milk in there and ne- the other state in the afternoon, is it? <laughs> the one way trip to Tassie with the rest oh, of the that? convicts. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to know, you know, you've seen all the different systems and you've seen the books of a lot of these farms yes. too, from a financial yep. point of view. Yeah. I'd uh, love to know your thoughts around yeah, what maybe has the most financial impact. Is it dependent on the like you know, per- personal circumstances? Um, what would you be your suggestions around that? In regards to milking frequency, do you mean? Or? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess um, which farmers maybe take the worst hit and take long to recover, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 ones, the ones today, guys, if they don't get their ducks in the row first. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go once a day if I had a very high debt load and the bank wasn't keen, because we do see that, you know, guys will launch into it and say, hey, this is going to solve all my problems. I'll cut out some labor. And they're starting to cut into the muscle, into the bone, because they actually didn't, um, you know, they were doing 100,000 milk solids before once a day, and they didn't get it right. And they're all of a sudden doing 85,000 milk solids. And the bank's got a criteria that, you know, you must still do 100,000 milk solids. And you can cut too much out. Um, the guys who actually plan it first, and they say, hey, well, I, I know if I have lots of heifers, we talked about that before, yeah. uh, I can change that. Um, why don't I milk twice a day till Christmas time, perhaps, and then actually have a trial run? And work our way through it, and everyone's expectations are um, being met along the way. Uh, yeah, and I look at Lincoln University; they're milking ten and seven all season. Bless the little cotton socks. Um, my next challenge to them is actually: why don't we change the milking frequencies throughout the season and see if we can capture better milk production and do things like that? Yeah, um, yeah. You know that that's a challenge for those guys. Uh, who do I see the financial? Stuff? Every everyone's different financially. Uh, it's all to do with debt loading, farm working expenses. Um, who can actually um, do all their partial budgets all the time and make sure their their feed um, levels are at a certain you know at a, at a comfortable level? You know we're getting a, a good feed response for the inputs we're putting in. Um, but as long as you're actually being able to meet your, I guess your financial criteria with the bank, that's the first thing. Um, and once you've got that out of the way, you're fine. Um, I think what you've got to do in any situation like this, Andrew, if it was me, I'd say, how many milk solids do we need to satisfy? our financial people, our family, 
and farm working. Now, if yep. you can tidy those up and say, hey, the starting point's 120,000 milk solids, let's work backwards from there. Which system can we do it with? Uh, and what impacts will they be if we change? What impacts the bank going to say to us if you're only doing 115,000? Yeah. But work backwards and say, well, hey, we know I've got farmers who you know, do 600 milk solids. I've got farmers who do less than half that. You know, they're on extremely challenging system on once a day with horrendous walks, um, very, very tough. And they both make money. Yeah. But it's all about the, the people, you know, it's the, the genetics of the people. Um, no, that's really good advice. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. There's a lot of planning, and I guess we're lucky now that we've got people like you who have put a lot of information out there that we can all tap into. Yeah, like, well, like, it's like all about the, sharing, isn't it? Yeah. Like the neighbour's collars, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'd love to know, um, you know, you've offered us heaps of value. It's been, yeah, a lot of takeaways. A lot of people are in this boat trying to figure out what best system to adopt, and there's some cool key takeaways. I love the fact that... Uh, potentially you don't have to stick to one system all season and really you can manipulate things as you go along and um, that's really really cool uh, what, what would be one key takeaway that you would offer advice to farmers who are considering a variable milking system oh gee that's a question I've never, i haven't heard that one <laughs> what would i what would be the one thing and i think you'd probably you know like say the once a day farmers are probably uh, they're on that journey anyway, but yeah, you know, potentially a lot probably want to dabble in ten and seven or sixteen yeah. hours. Mm. Don't be yeah, mm. don't be scared to have a go. Yeah, because it's not broken. You can always go back to twice a day. What you got to do is think of what's going to work for me and my system. Because be selfish. It's all about you. The cows will adapt. The milking company they'll get used to it eventually. The herd testers will never get used to it. Um, They'll still hunt me down every time I see them. Um, <laughs> just find something that's going to work for you. Start backwards with the financial stuff. Say, how much can I afford to do? How much milk do I need? Um, what system will work best for me? What do my staff want? What do I want? What do my family want? And, and look at your business and say, what would, what, how much do I need to produce and what do I need to, uh, to actually continue to run the business successfully? Um, don't be scared of having a crack at say 10 and seven. Oh, now one very good important point here. Um, we have some issues with staff in New Zealand, just like you do everywhere else in the world. And sometimes we have cows that um, uh, do not handle that um, double weekend milking on 10 and seven. So you've either got, you've got three choices really. You've got once a day with those cows, three and two or twice a day, typically. But wait, there's one more. It's 11 and seven. And 11 and 7 is basically um, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, once a day. And the rest of the week's twice a day. No matter how you want to string that together. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Saturday, twice a day. And Andrew, you might, might want to put some graphics up with this um, when, you, when you send it out. Um, but basically what it means is most people have most of their staff available on Monday, Tuesday, at the start of the week. Get those two days out of the way, then if you want stable the rest of the week to be quite stable, just Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday once a day. It's those two days in the weekend on 10 and 7 that can often tip things over for somatics. And we're seeing yeah. a bit of that. Um, yeah. so yeah, so eleven and seven is also really good. I've had a lot of people who've um, done that because they've been had overload with somatics. So give that a crack. Yeah, that's really cool advice. And I probably haven't um, put you in the picture. We've got one of our sponsors is actually Corey Diagnostics, and they've developed a, a Staph aureus ELISA test. Um, okay. Similar. And uh, they're hoping to roll that out in New Zealand pretty soon, but we've been using that in Tassie, and that is identifying cows that are uh, carrying Staph. And it's um, potentially oh. a game changer in that, what you were talking about there. Cool. Because mm. cool. we don't yeah. want to tip those cows over. And, and guys, for, for mental health and that, and just for actually having a life, have a crack at it. We are a, a what do we call it? We're a, we're a weekend-based society and dairy farming doesn't fit. So we've got to become weekend-centric and that's where 10 and 7 has become such a huge part of any, people's lives. And I've had emails, phone calls, you name it, from all over the world, from people I couldn't even understand. We had to use translation systems on their computer to actually make it work. And just talking through, you know, had guys from Wales with mental health issues talking them through it they hadn't seen their children for, for days because they're working so hard we put them on 10 and 7 and all of a sudden they had breakfast with their children one morning their kids didn't even know what dad looked like 
it's pretty cool to actually see this change of, for so many businesses. And have a go. If it's ever any doubt, Andrew, tell them to flick me an email and I'll help out. I'm more than happy to do it. This uh, it's become a real passion of mine. I'm, I'm working full time, but um, uh, there's always some time at night where I squeeze a few emails in. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So how does someone get hold of you there, Brent? Uh, they can get me at B-B-O-Y-C-E, so b Boyce at lic.co.nz. That's fantastic. Really appreciate it. And you've obviously got a deep down passion, um, especially the mental health stuff. Really love how that intertwines with, with farming systems. Yeah. Hey, cool. how, thanks, Andrew. It's been yeah, awesome. thanks heaps. So much value. And we'll catch up with you soon. Good on you. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the High Performance Herd podcast. Thanks to the sponsors, Fonterra, IDEX, Kuru Diagnostics, Taz Herd, the Tasmanian Dairy Trust, Zoetis, NHIA, Data Mars. Feel free to subscribe and review the podcast. Share it with your friends. The more, the merrier. Jump on Facebook, search the High Performance Herd Project, and you're very welcome to join the High Performance Herd private Facebook group. If you want to see a video of this podcast, jump on YouTube or www.highperformanceherd.com where you'll see a link to these sponsors for more information and more information on the High Performance Herd project, which is a real life dairy farm, spring block farming right here in Tassie. Thanks very much and we'll see you next week.